Hello everyone and welcome to our online message platform. We are so excited that you've decided to join us today. If you're new to Inland Hills Church, we are so excited that you are here with us today and we wanna get to know you a little bit more. So please take a moment to click the link below the video. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how we could be praying for you this week. If you call Inland Hills home, thank you for your continued partnership in giving with us today. You can continue to do so by visiting inlandhills.com slash give. Now we are about to dive into an exciting message and we just wanna invite you to lean into the words that you are about to hear. It is our hopes that these words and this message uplifts you during the week ahead and just encourages you throughout whatever you are facing. Good morning, Inland Hills. Good morning. So we're in a series called Momentum, and what we said last week is that we really want to talk about who we are and why we're here. I believe that momentum is when you are consistently living into who you are and why you are here. And so today, I want to talk about some of the barriers that sometimes get in our way when we're thinking through who we, who we are and why we're here, and when we're trying to live that out to the fullest. Um, so, a little bit that you should know. When I was about three years old, please smile, I want it to be good. When I was about three years old, my, uh, my grandfather on my mom's side of the family actually passed away. He'd struggled with sickness for a long time. He was a really good man. Some of you are just not awake yet. He was a really, <laughs> he's a really good man. And uh, so, hey, studio, I haven't forgotten about you. Smile, studio. I want you guys to smile. Smile. Oh, you look, you look beautiful. That was a great photo. Good. So uh, he, he, he passed away, and my, my grandmother then, uh, a few years went by, and the rumor got around town. It was a small town, about 2,500 people. Rumor got around town that my grandmother might have started dating again, but she hadn't told the family. And the family had problems with that. It was scandalous. So like my, like my mom and some of her sisters like went and Sasha was like, well, mom, are you dating again? She was like, oh, oh, oh. you know, <laughs> yes, she was dating. So she was dating a man by the name of Arlie Leprad. Arlie had lost his wife some years earlier as well. And Arlie to this day is just one of the best men that um, I've, I've ever known. Smile. Don't forget to smile. There we go. Perfect. All right, so, so they dated for a couple of years, and they decided to get married. And they asked my father, who, who's a minister, they asked him if he could officiate the wedding. And so he decided to, but they wanted to make it like a, a kind of a small, an informal kind of thing. And so they asked him to come do it, and they just invited some family members, and, they, and, and that was pretty much it. It was, just, it was just family and some very close friends. There were probably less than, than 40 people there, and they just had it at, uh, for, for free. They were trying to save money. And so, looking good. Um, so th they had it uh, for, for free in this very small church. And they get everybody together. They didn't want to hire like uh, a big flower thing. They didn't want to hire a photographer. And so my dad decided he would both officiate and take the photos. So he had just gotten a, a new camera at the time that he was very, very proud of. No one actually asked him to take the photos. He just wanted to. So, so and he was, he was so obnoxious with this camera. Like, he would walk around all day and just be like, like, hey, smile. Or he wouldn't say that at all. You know, just do that over and over. And as they're actually, he's officiating the ceremony. So he's looking at Arlene. And he's like, do you take this woman to be your wife? And as he's saying, I do, he's raising the camera up and, like, <laughs> flashing a picture of Arlene saying, I do. So it was like, it was on the ground, like, first person. It was, it was like photos everywhere, right, all day long. So he's really proud of himself, really proud of all the little candid shots he got. He goes home, and uh, he's starting to, to wind it to get the film prepared because, uh, for those of you who are younger, film is a thing that we used to put into a camera in order to put pictures on, and then we'd have to take it to, uh, to a, a store, and then they would have to take that film and make it into pictures. It was all mysterious. We never knew how it worked, and then suddenly it stopped working like that completely. So... Uh, so he's, he's messing with that, so he opens up the, he thinks he's got it fully wound, so he opens up the back of the camera to take the film out, only to realize he forgot to put film in the camera. So the only set of photos that we have from that whole day is non-existent. It, it exists only in his head. That's it. He felt so terrible about it. Have you, have you ever tried to do something kind or something good? better yourself, better somebody else, or try to live into something you've been called to, or to be, you know, be like the kind of person you know that God's called you to be, and then found it difficult to actually execute on it. Something prevents it, or something gets in your way. And in fact, um, there was a book that came out a few years ago by a man named Stephen Pressfield. Stephen Pressfield's an author. He wrote the, the book The Legend of Bagger Vance. It's probably his most popular novel. He writes historical dramas, and that was turned into a film starring Matt Damon and, and Will Smith. And so he wrote a book called The War of Art. 
And to my knowledge, Stephen Pressfield is not a Christian, not a follower of Jesus, but it's so interesting the way that he ended up talking about the forces that oppose us in the world when we're trying to do something good. In fact, from his book, this is, this is what he says toward the beginning. Most of us have two lives, the life we live and the unlived life within us. Between the two stands resistance. And it's always capitalized in the book because he believes that resistance, however he defines it, is kind of a, a force, a negative force that's at work within the world. So he goes on. Are you a writer who doesn't write? A painter who doesn't paint, an entrepreneur who never starts a venture, then you know what resistance is. And he goes on to, to list 11 of resistance's greatest hits. These are the things that you try to do, but you just really struggle to do them. And you don't have to take notes on all these. These are just interesting, right? The book's fascinating. I think it's less than 100 pages. If you're ever interested, you can check it out. Uh, resistance's greatest hits. He says this, uh, the pursuit of any calling in writing, painting, music, film, dance, or any creative art, however marginal or unconventional. In other words, if you're going to try to do something creative, you're going to face resistance. You're going to want to procrastinate. You're going to want to put it off. You're going to find that it's just difficult to finish it or to accomplish it. You're going to be filled with self-doubt as to whether it's actually a pursuit worth following after or not. There will be resistance, capital R, resistance. The launching of any entrepreneurial venture or enterprise for profit or otherwise. To start that off, you're going to face resistance. Any diet or health regimen. Now do we understand? Are we on the same page now? I was like, I don't know about that other stuff, but yeah, I totally understand that. So yeah, yeah, you're going to face resistance if you try to lean into that. Any program of spiritual advancement, you, you want to become, in his, in his mind, in his words, like more spiritually enlightened or more, thought, more thoughtful as a human being, like you're going to face resistance around that. Any activity whose aim is tighter abdominals, yes, right? Resistance, you're going to face that. Um, any course or program designed to overcome an unwholesome habit or addiction. There's all kinds of addictions in the world. For some of us, we, we struggle with addiction to a substance. We struggle with addiction maybe to uh, behavioral addictions like pornography, or we struggle with addictions um, even to, to like video games, or frankly, to, to just isolation. Sometimes we can become addicted to isolation and disconnect us from other people. There's all kinds of things. But if you've ever tried to push back against that, overcome that, you've probably faced resistance. Education of every kind. It's hard. It's difficult. You'll face resistance. Any act of political, moral, or ethical courage, including the decision to change oneself for the better. You would think that this would be easy, but it's actually really, really difficult. In fact, he would go on to say that the better a thing it is that you're trying to do, the more resistance you will face. He actually believes you can almost run your life by finding the resistance and doing it anyway. Like when you find that resistance, then, then you can actually figure out, okay, well that's actually a really good thing to do. It's just interesting the way he thinks about it. The undertaking of any enterprise or endeavor whose aim is to help others, right? We've experienced this, and sometimes in big ways and sometimes in small. I heard, uh, I heard an interview with uh, a gentleman on a television show a few months ago. He was visiting Spain. He's from the United States, and he doesn't speak Spanish. And so he was at this small restaurant with a friend of his, and he, he had to go to the bathroom. So he goes into the bathroom, and he sits down, and he does his business, number two, and that's important for later. Otherwise, I wouldn't be so graphic as to use a number like that. So he, he stands up, and he, and, and he flushes the toilet, and it, it won't flush down. And because he's, he's a kind-hearted person, he doesn't want to be the kind of guy that leaves that kind of mess and just walks away from it for someone else to have to worry about. So he's like, ah, I need a plunger, but there's not a plunger in there. And he thought, okay, I don't mind taking care of this myself, but I'm gonna have to go tell some of the wait staff that I need, right? I need a, I need a plunger to help. So he goes and he, he, he taps a waiter on the shoulder and he's like, hey, um, I'm so sorry, I stopped up the toilet. I'd be happy to, to plunge it myself or to take care of it myself. I just need to know where that is. Well, the waiter only spoke Spanish, didn't speak English, and so they have a real communication problem. So he finally says, okay, well, can you come here? Can you come here? And so the waiter comes with him. He opens the bathroom door, and he shows him the poo in the toilet. And then he tries to, and he's going to show him that it's not flushing. So he presses the button, and it flushes right away. So in the waiter's minds, this guy just brought me in here, showed me his business, flushed it, and said, good day, sir. Like, that was it. <laughs> right? So like, you try to do the right thing, <laughs> and then you're met with, Resistance, like the undertaking of any enterprise or endeavor whose aim is to help others. Like it's just like you're, there's resistance there. Any act that entails commitment of the heart, the decision to get married, to have a child, to weather a rocky patch in a relationship. Like, like for those of us who have walked into these things, tried to wrestle with these things, we understand something 
of the resistance that you can face in it, the taking of any principled stand in the face of adversity, it's very difficult to do. You will face all kinds of resistance. And this is kind of what he goes on to say after, after kind of listing the greatest hits. He says, rule of thumb, the more important a call of, or action is to our soul's evolution, the more resistance we will feel toward pursuing it. In other words, if, if this is really what we want to move, like if in our soul's evolution, like if, if the more important it is, the more resistance we will feel. And in that, 21st century author Stephen Pressfield sounds an awful, like, an awful lot like first century follower of Jesus, Paul, who said, For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. Paul said that in the book of Romans, that there's resistance. Even when I want to do the right thing, I find that the world seems to oppose me in doing the right thing. There's an internal struggle of my own desire. There's an external struggle. The world is actually pushing back. There's some force in the world that pushes back on me, creating barriers barriers and obstacles, and, and it is difficult. And we see this happen all the time. We see it in, in big ways and in, in small ways. So I'll, I'll give you a small one and I'll, and I'll give you like a larger one. Small one. Um, my, uh, my mother-in-law, uh, her name is, is Debbie. And uh, I was one of those guys that I had heard nightmare stories about mother-in-laws my, my entire life before I got married. And so I was just really worried about what that relationship would be like. And then I, I married into an amazing family and I have a fantastic mother-in-law and father-in-law. And so that's really great. And uh, my, my parents are really great too. At least I think so. And my wife seems to, yes, she, nodding her head, yes, great. Okay, so we seem to agree. So we both really have a ton of appreciation for our in-laws. I have a friend of mine uh, who lives in Pennsylvania who uh, we were just talking about our in-laws uh, a couple of weeks ago. And he said, yes, yeah, Similarly, like the night before his wedding, he was thinking like, oh, I'm about to move into this mother-in-law area. And he's like, I've always heard nightmares. And then he started thinking about his own mother and he realized, oh no, my mom's going to be the crazy mother-in-law. <laughs> Plot twist. I did not see that coming. Like, and he realized like, yeah, it's his mom. His mom's going to be great. And sure enough, she has been. So, um, <laughs> So, so my mother-in-law, though, has, has been fantastic, and, and our boys were with her a few weeks ago in Texas while we were packing up the boxes in Pennsylvania to get ready to, to move out here to California to, to be with you guys. And so, so they're in Texas, and uh, my, my son Jack, his, the cousin that's closest in age to him is a cousin named Aiden. Uh, Aiden is seven, Jack is six years old, and Jack saw Aiden doing something he wasn't supposed to do. And Jack has a very high sense of justice, so if he catches you doing something wrong, he will snitch on you without even thinking about it. Like, so he, he ran to his grandmother to my, my mother-in-law, Debbie, and said, hey, Aiden was doing something he wasn't supposed to. So Aiden gets in trouble. The kids are mad at Aiden for doing it. And so Aiden's kind of crying to, to Debbie. His, his grandmother said, oh, it's all, none of my cousins like me very much. She said, oh, it just breaks your heart to, feel, to, to hear that sentence. So she's patting him on the back. She said, oh, Aiden, baby, that's not true. They just didn't like that thing you did, but they love you. They love you so much. My son, Jack, having not heard that, walks into the room right at that moment and just yells, Aiden, you are my least favorite cousin, and walks away. <laughs> Aiden looked at Debbie and said, well, that wasn't helpful. (laughs) She's trying to do the right thing, right, to console, but there's resistance. There's resistance. It's a small thing, but there's resistance. Bigger thing. Bigger thing. You pour all of your heart and your time and your emotion into your marriage only to find that no matter how much you give it, it's not reciprocated by your, your spouse. You're willing to go to marriage counseling. You're willing to change. You're willing to take whatever steps are necessary to repair this thing. And yet you come to realize with a crushing, a crushing amount of certainty that that there is no way that one person can single-handedly make this relationship work. There's resistance. And you push and you push and you push. And sometimes that story ends well and sometimes it doesn't. But it it is heartbreaking to walk through it. Resistance. Or... You know that you should give your marriage more. You know you should. You are actually able, to some extent, to pull back from it and look at it almost as like a a bystander, to be an anthropologist of yourself and realize that you're not helping your marriage and you're not being good for your spouse. And yet when the moment comes, you don't. You don't lean in. You don't offer empathy. You don't do everything you can to make it work. Resistance. Even when I want to do good, I find myself doing bad. What is that? What is that? 
Well, today we're going to look, we're going to continue looking at this, this letter that Paul, in the first century, he's one of the first leaders in the Christian church. He wrote a good chunk of our New Testament. He's writing a letter to this church at Thessalonica. He went and planted this church. This church got off to a great start. Then he left to go plant other churches. But he's hearing that they had a lot of opposition, that they faced a lot of trials and persecution. So he's writing to them, having found out that they've withstood those, to basically celebrate that. He's, the section we're going to look at today, he's talking about how much he longs to come and visit them. And so uh, we're going to start here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. But, brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. Now, it's possible, some, some scholars believe that Paul had been accused of not caring about them or not wanting to come see them because he goes like over the top here to try to show them just how much he cares about them. Like we were separated by you. In other words, like we, you know, there was distance between us, physical distance. I had to go to another town and you stayed there. And instead of just saying like, you know, we've been apart for a long time, he says, we were orphaned by being separated you f- from you for a short time. Like this really strong language. You know, when, you, when you're in that relationship, like maybe in middle school or high school, kind of your first like serious relationship with, with somebody else, and, and you have those phone calls at night, or I guess they're text messages now or whatever, like the whole like, you hang up. No, you hang up. I miss you so much. I can't wait to see you. It's just like that over and over again, and you know, your parents are listening in their room, and they're like, Bleh. like it's just, you know, they just don't deal with it very well. Like that, there's that feeling, and that, that's like that, that, that puppy love, you know? But puppy love has always felt real to the puppy. And so you just, you think it's deep. You don't know that it's not, and then it'll probably pass fairly soon. But then you get out of that, and then, then maybe, you, you know, your life takes on greater shape. And the older you get, the deeper your relationships go with, with fi- friends or with family members. And then there's a, a, a different kind of longing when you're separated from them. When I'm, when I'm away from my boys for, for a few days or for a week, like, it is, it, is a, it is tough. Like, I miss them so much. And this is what he's trying to, to tell them. Like, look, there's a, there's a depth of loving and caring and longing that I have for you that when we were separated, even for a short time, it felt like being orphaned. Out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. Like, I really wanted to be there. So why has he not come? Well, he's faced resistance. He's faced resistance, a roadblock. And he says this, For we wanted to come to you, certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan blocked our way. And this is where we're going to take a time out and pause for a second, because uh, I realize that every week we have lots of people uh, join us here at Inland Hills that you've, this is your first time in church in a really long time, or you've never been to church before, or maybe you've been here a while, but you're, you're still not sure what you think about the Jesus stuff, about religion, about Christianity, about any of that. And so you're here, and you're, you're open, and I'm like so glad that you're here. Regardless of your journey or what you think about all this, like I'm really excited that you would join us today and that you would think through and process with us. Like we're stoked to have you. We really are. But, but when I throw a word like Satan up here, some of you might feel like, okay, like I was good with the Jesus thing. Paul was fine. I really appreciated the toilet illustration. But, but like I am, I am not sure what to do with, with this. For some of us, when we think about Satan, we just think about like, you know, the church lady. Like it's, you know, well, isn't that special? Like, like when she used to say like, like, I don't know, who could it be? Could it be, could it be Satan? Like that was that, you know, and she was just, she was a caricature on Saturday Night Live played by Dana Carvey that she was just like the little old church lady who was always upset about everything and fairly, fairly angry. Like, and that's just kind of what we think. It's almost like this is kind of a caricature. And I got to be honest, this is like my second full week here with you guys. And truthfully, I, like, we have a great staff here, like a really great staff and production team. Like, like our production team runs these, like, you wouldn't see any of this without them every Sunday morning. We love them, and our staff is fantastic. In fact, can we just give a, like, warm thank you to our staff real fast? They're awesome folks. They really are. So now that I've said that, I want to throw Brian Murphy under the bus for just a minute, okay? So... Brian Murphy is one of our pastors here. He's an awesome guy. You've seen him on this. If you've been around for a while, you've seen him on the platform a number of times. And, and Brian and some of our other teams, uh, they've been working through developing series because we've been without a lead pastor for a while, different series. And so they kind of give the incoming guest speakers, like, here's a passage we'd like you to speak on. And then, you know, our, our communications team creates the graphics for that and everything. There's a whole process. Well, they didn't know for sure when a lead pastor was going to be hired or when I was going to be here. So they'd already developed the series. We're in momentum. And so I was kind of given some passages to speak on for this first 
series. I would not have personally chosen in my second week with you to speak on Satan, but here we are, right? And so I thought, like, it's in the text, and so we're not going to avoid it. Let's talk about it, because if, again, if you're not sure what you think about church, like, this may feel weird. The question is, why wasn't Paul able to visit the church in Thessalonica? And, and is it because some figure with, you know, horns and a pointy tail and a pitchfork was guarding the road? Is that what we think that he's talking about here? And, and I just, I just want to think about this in an in a interesting kind of way. I, all throughout the New Testament, when the scripture talks about, and these are, these are people writing, right? So when Jesus talks about, when Paul talks about, when James, when Peter talks about, when they talk about sin, that's just this darkness in our lives. It's our human propensity to break things and make a mess of things. They almost talk about it as if it's personified and has a will of its own throughout the world. Like over and over and over, you see that. And then we also occasionally get kind of the, I would say just, just the cloak pulled back a little bit, the curtain pulled back to where we can see what's happening in the spiritual realm. What, what Jesus seems to point to is that there, there is a physical realm that we can all see in a spiritual one, and those two are not separate, but they actually live interlocked with one another, and that there's all kinds of things happening in the spiritual realm that we, we aren't able to see. And i got to be honest with you. This is a thing that I really struggled with. In my early 20s, I almost walked away from faith, and while I don't have time to tell that whole story today, I'll just tell you, the whole spiritual dimension piece of Christianity, I really struggled with. I struggled with miracles, I struggled with angels, I struggled with demons, I definitely struggled with any kind of concept of Satan. That just didn't seem like the real world to me, and it was very important, like, I was, I'm incre- I was increasingly getting into science and understanding um, something, like, at a lay, at a lay level about uh, chemistry and biology and astrophysics, like, those were just interesting things for me. So to get into some kind of spiritual realm that I could neither like prove or disprove was uncomfortable for me. And it was one of the reasons, not the only one, but one of the reasons that I started questioning the whole faith. What finally brought me back to Christianity, the short version, is that I just decided I had to ask myself the question, is Jesus worth following? Is Jesus worth following? Like at the heart of all of it, that was the question. Do I believe that if I follow after his teachings, that if I actually align my life around what he's calling me to do, that he will make my life better and make me better at life. Is that what I believe? And I decided to basically just step out on faith and give that a try. And by faith, there's lots of different ways to talk about faith, but what I, what I find helpful is, is faith is like a, a branch that's extending away from a tree. Like you're high up in a tree and there's a branch that's sticking out and you're on top of that branch. And, and faith is not running to the end of that branch assuming it'll support you. Faith is one step at a time putting your foot forward and testing whether it holds your weight. So this is what I started doing. Like, okay, I'm going to start trying to live by how Jesus tells me to live. I'm going to take that step. What's the result? Well, my life started to improve. My relationship started to improve. Okay, so he had really great ethical advice. That's good. What if I started thinking about him as more than just a great ethical teacher? What if I started to believe that maybe he really did do the miracles that maybe he actually is somehow holding this universe all together. How would that change my life? And I started to step out, take that next step forward. And unfortunately, at that point, I ran out of stage for the rest of this illustration. But <laughs> there are multiple steps, though. There are multiple steps in this process, right, as you continue to step out. And, and you just start to ask yourself, okay, so if I got to a place where I started to determine, okay, I believe in the moral and ethical teachings of Jesus. They've absolutely made my life a better place. I, I, think, I think that like a relationship with God is what Jesus is calling me into. I buy all that. Well, then I had to realize that Jesus had a lot to say about the supernatural world as well. And that Jesus felt that one of his main ministries was to come and to, in his words, to, to tie up the strong man. The strong man being the force of darkness personified in, in Satan and the demonic realm. Like that force of darkness that was holding us back, that was leading to the resistance that we were facing with our relationship with God in the world. So Jesus comes to basically de- destroy sin and evil and the devil, like all those things, is what we see repeatedly throughout the New Testament. First John even says that the primary work that Jesus does is to destroy the work of the devil. So there's some kind of spiritual realm at work that Jesus constantly points to. And I know as a 21st century person, especially when, like, if, if you're not sure where you're at with faith in Jesus, like, that can feel like a really weird thing to talk about. I agree with you. It is weird. It's not second week that I'm here kind of material. But yet, here we are. Thanks, Brian. So... <laughs> 
so that you know, the way I land on it is if Jesus, who I've decided to base my life around, believes that this is the way the world works, who am I to disagree with that? And so it was my trust in Jesus that led me to trust that there is perhaps more going on around me in the world than my senses can possibly pick up. In fact, the, the more that we learn about the world around us, the more that we learn there is plenty that our senses are incapable of picking up. And so that got me interested in continuing to look into what, what else does Scripture say about the spiritual realm? Now, look, I, I don't think that Scripture says enough about us for us to put any kind of system together that says exactly how it works at all. I want to show you one weird, freaky passage that helps us say, like, oh, I don't know what that's about, and then we'll move on. It's just for us to realize, like, that we can't possibly answer these questions. Sorry that you had to see Dana Carvey and drag twice. All right, so um, this is in Daniel chapter 10. We don't have time to read the whole chapter, but I encourage you to check it out later if, you, if this is interesting to you. Uh, in Daniel chapter 10, it's a book in the Old Testament, Daniel is uh, someone who receives visions from God, and often he helps the king understand the visions. So he receives a vision in chapter 10, but he doesn't understand it. So he starts to pray, and he says, God, I just want to understand the vision that you've given me. Can you help me understand what, what, what it is that you're saying? Well, he prays and he prays this one day, two days, three days, four days, but, but he's never given any understanding. And i got to be honest with you, after three, four, five straight days of praying for something, uh, I might have given up. A lot of us might have given up. Like, okay, well, maybe it's not God's will that we know this stuff, right? Like, I guess I, I can stop praying for that now, or maybe I just forget about it or something. But Daniel keeps praying, and he prays for 21 straight days. And after 21 straight days, an angel of the Lord appears to him in pretty dramatic fashion. Like he's down by the river, the angel appears, he's with some other men who can't see the angel, but they get terrified and they go and like run behind like rocks and boulders and trees. And so, so he's talking to this angel and this is what the angel says. Do not be afraid, Daniel. By the way, do not be afraid, do not fear is one of the most common commandments in all of scripture. In other words, God is with you. God has got this. Do not be afraid. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your Lord, your words were heard and I have come in response to them. Okay, so if since the first day he was dispatched from Central to come give a message to Daniel, why is it taking 21 days for him to get there? I'm so glad you asked because he does explain. Kind of. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me for 21 days, and then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Say what? <laughs> what, what just, what? I mean, I want to hear about the vision stuff too, but what, I, what? So what did he just say? Hey, look, Daniel, you prayed that uh, you would understand this vision. I want you to know God sent me out like the very first day. From the very first moment you asked, I was sent. But I was opposed. I was resisted. I was resisted by the prince of Persia, who seems to be some type of territorial demon or territorial demonic force. Like, I was opposed by that. And so we fought for 21 days. And then the archangel Michael showed up, and he was like, I got this. You go talk to Daniel, and then you come back. So Michael fought him. I came. I'm going to give you this message. And then at the end of all this, after he gives Daniel the message, he says, now I've got to go back because the prince of Egypt is going to join the fight, and Michael needs my help. What is happening here? It's like the curtain gets pulled back just a little bit on a spiritual realm that we almost never see and never hear talked about within the scripture, and it is weird. Scripture seems to actually depict God as being at war with malevolent forces all throughout the universe that want to thwart God's will and that want to thwart you from fully flourishing. They do not want you flourishing, and they do not God, want God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is some kind of resistance in the world. Now, I'm not, let me, let me tell you what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that we have to look for a demon behind every tornado or hurricane. I'm not saying that every trial, tribulation you face in your life is the direct result of a personified force of, of demonic power in your life. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we live in a world that is fallen. We have humans who have fallen from God and we seem to have angelic beings who have also fallen away from God. And I'm saying that in that fallen world, when, when humans and angelic beings all have the free will to choose for God, to choose to follow him, they also seem to have the free will to choose not to follow God. 
And so we have this situation where, where God is working all things together for his good, but there are forces that oppose him. And what Paul is saying to the Thessalonican church is, look, we wanted to come to you, but a number of things happened. We faced resistance in the world, and Satan seemed to want to oppose us. And it doesn't have to be that Satan personified appeared on the road with horns and a tail. By the way, not what any kind of thing would look like. It's a cartoon. And, and that, that, that that was the reason that we couldn't go. It can be that there's, there's a whole kingdom of which Satan represents that kingdom. It is the kingdom that is in opposition to the will of God being done on earth as it is in heaven. And that kingdom prohibited us from going. Like blockades were put in our way. It's the same kingdom then that he's going to tell the Thessalonians is, is basically responsible for the trials and tribulations that you've faced. And so uh, he goes on here. For what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. In other words, like, Paul is so excited about what God is doing in this Thessalonican church that he says, like, you're actually a piece of why, like, of, of our reward, we think, when, when all this is over and the earth has come to an end and it's being remade. There's a new heaven and a new earth combined together. When all that happens, like, we think that, that our glory, the thing that we've done that, that God will see is so good, it's, it's that we've poured into you. And we've seen the work that God's done in you. Like, that's how much he loves and cares for this church. So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker in God's service and spreading the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you in your faith so that no one would be unsettled by these trials. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. In other words, look, we heard you were going through a hard time, and we couldn't take it anymore. We had to know how you were doing. So we sent Timothy to check on you. And you're going through these trials. This is so important. For you know quite well that we are destined for them. Destined for what? We're destined for trials. In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. This is really important. Because oftentimes, um, I think that we're, we're asked to consider following after Jesus when we're sold like a false bill of goods. Like we're told things like, you know, if, if you'll just follow after Christ, then, um, you know, you, you, your life will be happier, like your problems will go away, all, all the mistakes the past are dealt with. Now, that's true, but, like, and, and sometimes we're sold that, like, God just wants you to be happy and wealthy and wise. Like, God just wants to be generous with you constantly and just pour out. And look, I think God does want the best for us. Absolutely, he wants the best for us. But we have to remember that we, individually, are one piece of a larger whole, one piece of a larger puzzle, and that while, while God wants the best for us, he is also working constantly to make sure that his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And sometimes what's best for the whole is actually worse for the individual. Please keep in mind, please keep in mind that our, our faith was founded on Jesus Christ, the most innocent man, the best person who was crucified, murdered, even though he lived a perfect life. Keep in mind that the apostles, the very first followers after Jesus Christ, save for Judas who hung himself for betraying Jesus, and John who died of old age in prisons on the island of Patmos, all the rest of those apostles were killed for their faith, including Paul, who we've alluded to several times, who wrote this letter. He was blamed, as a whole group of Christians were, for the burning of Rome under Emperor Nero in the 60s and 70s, and, and he was killed for his faith as well. In fact, for, for many, many Christians, choosing to follow after Jesus doesn't give them an easier life. For many, many Christians, choosing to follow after Jesus doesn't give them a happier life. For many Christians, it gives them a better life, but better doesn't necessarily mean trial-free. It means living into something bigger than yourself. So what Paul is saying, look, we kept telling you that you would be persecuted, and it turned out that way, as you well know. We know that that happened. He continues on. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you, and that our labors might have been in vain. I was afraid that our labors might have been in vain. So I just want to talk through that for a second. Paul's major concern with the church at Thessalonica is that like we set you up really well and you started off on this journey with Christ and you started off with great vigor, but then you're going to face trials and persecution because that's what happens. That's the kind of trials and persecutions like we all will face those. That's the life we're going to live. 
He said, so we were afraid that if, when you face trials and persecutions, it might lead you to abandon your faith, to fall away from your calling. But that's not what happened. We were afraid the tempter, the same resistant force in the universe that's constantly opposing the will of God and constantly opposing your own flourishing, we were afraid that that tempter might pull you away from the faith, but that's not what happened. Thankfully, they were prepared to face the trials when they came, and it changed everything for them. Fast forward to the 21st century, and I'm not sure that we're always prepared to face the trials when they come. I think oftentimes we're caught off guard by them. Please understand, make a note of this. In this life, you will have much trouble. You will. Jesus promised it. In this life, you will have much trouble. You just will. And so everything may be going great right now, but please know there's another trial coming in your future. And the more you try to impact the world, the more you pray, like, God, help me to make a huge impact on the world. You don't get to make a big impact without facing a big challenge. That's just not the way the world works. Why? Because to make a big impact, you have to push back on the resistance. You have to push back on the sin and the depravity and whatever malevolent forces that, that, that God is having to fight constantly throughout the scriptures of fallen angels. Like, you have to push back on all that stuff. And so you're going to face hard times. And a lot of times it's easy for us in the midst of that to ask the question like, where is God in this? Why didn't you protect me from this? Why didn't you pull me out of this? Like, this doesn't make any sense. It's not fair. Like, we often talk about, like, in that way all the time. That's kind of our first immediate impulse. It's our first flinch. But what Jesus tells us and what Paul tells us and what the first century church experienced was that, of course, you'll have trials. Of course, you'll face persecution and tribulation. Of course you'll face those things. Life is a mess. The thing is that we're not defined by the mess. We're defined by our response to the mess. That's what defines us. You're going to face trials, but what do you do with that? If I were to ask you, hey, like if we were able to sit down for coffee and I were to say, hey, tell me about the time that, that you were the most transformed by God or the experiences that have shaped you the most, most of you would tell me about a really difficult time in your life that you faced. Most of you would tell me about something that you weren't sure you could make it through until you finally did. Most of you wouldn't say, like, oh, let me tell you about the time I went to Disneyland and it was sweet. Like, like that's not your starting place. When were you most transformed? Man, I got this really sweet truck one time and it just, like, changed my life. Like, most of you wouldn't say that. Why? Because most of you recognize the reason you are the person you are today, the reason you've had the growth that you've had in your life is not because of the fun, happy, exciting moments. It's because you faced a difficult challenge and you saw God come alongside of you and get you through it. You, by the way, may not have felt his presence in the midst of it. You may have wondered where he was as you walked through it. You may have doubted whether he was good when you were in the heat of the moment until you recognize that there's someone else with me in the midst of this fire. Franciscan friars used to say that the pathway forward is the pathway of descent. That you can't actually come up until you've first gone down. And that in the midst of the trials and the tribulations and the persecutions that you might face in your life, the difficult times, the things you never saw coming, the resistance to the good that you try to do in the world, all of that, in the midst of those roadblocks, there is so much to be learned and gleaned from, and, it's, and, and that's the thing that will change you and transform you. If you continue to rely on God during those moments in such a way that you were able to come out of those and fully live into who you are and why you are here. It's the pathway of descent that leads to the pathway forward. That's how life works. It's not easy, but it's important. So we can choose to look at these trials and tribulations through a couple of lenses. You can look through it through a narrow lens and say like, well, this is just me and this just stinks and every moment is hard and I hate it. Or you can back way up, look at it in the wide lens and look back over the times you faced trials before in your life and say like, this is what God did there. That's how I got to this place. That's what that thing did in me and how it changed me. And you just start to see the, the pattern, the tapestry that he's creating out of all these things. It's not because God sends the bad. It's not because God forces you through it. It's because the world is a fallen world and you're going to face opposition, but that God will work even that bad stuff together to make you the best he can that you may have an impact on the world for the good of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. 
So, a few years ago, Arlie LaPrade, my step-grandfather, passed away. He was in his 80s, and the awesome thing about being in your 80s is that, yes, you get to live a lot of life and have a lot of experience. That's awesome. The tough thing about being in your 80s is a lot of times your friends have kind of like passed away, or in his case, his first wife had passed away, and that can be difficult. It can be really hard. My, grand, my great-grandfather lived to the age of 96, and he said his favorite thing about being 96 was the fact that there was no peer pressure. <laughs> All of his peers had died years before. My grandmother just passed away a few months ago. She lived to the ripe old age of 101 years old. So I, I don't know, like, people do clap at that a lot of times and it's always like, like she just wouldn't die, guys. Like I don't know, is that worth, <laughs> is that worth applauding? Like maybe, she was, she was an awesome lady. Studio, still haven't forgotten about you. Smile, you're looking beautiful, perfect. So, um, so in, in, in 101, her joke was that she was, uh, she was ready to go whenever the Lord took her because she was afraid that some of her friends had gotten to heaven and had decided she hadn't made it. And so uh, she, was, she was ready to go. And so she, she passed away. So at R. Lee LaPrade's funeral, um, my, my father also did that ceremony. And he began taking pictures of the crowd there with his camera in the midst of that ceremony. He took pictures all over that funeral. My dad said he did that because he wanted to tell Arlie when he saw him on the other side of eternity, I may have messed up the wedding, but I crushed it at the funeral. <laughs> camera was fully loaded, man. It's a small example, I know. But God used a moment in my father's life where he faced resistance and a roadblock and didn't go like he wanted to, and he helped my dad see a way to redeem that. And that, that's the promise of following after God. That there are all kinds of things that you may be facing that seem like today just a total and utter defeat, a disappointment, a resistance that you just can't overcome. But if you follow after Jesus, you believe in a concept that's incredibly important. You believe in something called resurrection. You believe that that thing that didn't go the way you'd hoped it would can actually be made new and restored and reconciled. You believe your own life with all the mistakes and the mishaps and the doubts and the uncertainties, you believe that that life can still be made brand new. You still have the opportunity to leave a legacy that's pleasing to God pleasing to Jesus, like no matter where you are, what you've come from or what you've done or what resistance you've faced or strongholds are in your life, you still have that chance. Julia Funt says that your legacy is a story that is still being written, but for which you hold the pen. That's absolutely true. And if you were to just hold it by yourself, that would be daunting, but you don't. No, God comes alongside of you. He is with you. And if you choose to give that whole mess over to him, he can make something beautiful from those ashes. My prayer for you is that whatever challenge you faced, whatever resistance is happening, whatever trial you drug through the door with you this morning, that you would leave here believing that God can meet you in the middle of that mess and create something beautiful out of it, that, that your story is not yet finished and you are not defined by your past. May we all join with Paul in the hope that even through trials, we will be steadfast and that our story has yet to be completed. Dear Lord, thank you for this time together this morning. And Father, I just, I just pray for each and every person in this room that you'll help them to live this week into who they are and why they're here. Lord, that as they do that day by day, moment by moment, week by week, that they start to build the kind of momentum in their lives that allows them to have a huge impact on the kingdom. And God, I think of wonderful saints like the Apostle Paul, who gave of his life, like all the apostles who came before him, who gave of their lives in order that the name of Jesus might be elevated and transform the lives of those around him. And I also thank you for Arlie LaPrade. Father, thank you for a good man who met my grandmother late in life, who cared for her, who drove his old beat up truck all over town to just sit with people who were sick and hear their story and pray with them. He's a saint as well. 
And Lord, we all face resistance to becoming that kind of a person. And I just pray in the midst of, in the midst of that resistance, we find hope in you. You are with us. You are for us. It's in Jesus' name I ask these things. Amen. Thank you so much for watching this message. It is our hopes that it encourages you and uplifts you in the week ahead. We also invite you to join us at one of our Sunday services here at 9, 11, or 5 p.m. Thank you for watching and we hope to see you here soon.